The Werewolf by Eugene Field In the reign of Egbert the Saxon there dwells in Britain a maiden named Isalt, who was beloved of all, both for her goodness and for her beauty. But, though many a youth came wooing her, she loved Harold only, and to him she plighted her troth. Among the other youth whom Isalt was beloved was Alfred, and he was sore angered that Isalt showed favor to Harold, so that one day Alfred said to Harold, Is it right that old Siegfried should come from his grave and have Isalt to wife? Then added he, Prithee, good sir, why do you turn so white when I speak your grandsire's name? Then Harold asked, What know you of Siegfried that you taunt me? What memory of him should vex me now? We know, and we know, retorted Alfred. There are some tales told us by our grandmas we have not forgot. So ever after that, Alfred's words and Alfred's bitter smile haunted Harold by day and night. Harold's grandsire, Siegfried the Teuton, had been a man of cruel violence. The legend said that a curse rested upon him, and that at certain times he was possessed of an evil spirit that wreaked its fury on mankind. But Siegfried had been dead full many years, and there was not to mind the world of him save the legend, and a cunning wrought spear which he had from Brumhilda the witch. This spear was such a weapon that it never lost its brightness, nor had its point been blunted. It hung in Harold's chamber, and it was the marvel among weapons of that time. Isalt knew that Alfred loved her, but she did not know of the bitter words which Alfred had spoken to Harold. Her love for Harold was perfect in its trust and gentleness. But Alfred had hit the truth. The curse of old Siegfried was upon Harold. Slumbering a century, it had awakened in the blood of the grandson, and Harold knew the curse that was upon him, and it was this that seemed to stand between him and Isalt. But love is stronger than all else, and Harold loved. Harold did not tell Isalt of the curse that was upon him, for he feared that she would not love him if she knew. Whensoever he felt the fire of the curse burning in his veins, he would say to her, Tomorrow I hunt the wild boar in the uttermost forest, or next week I go stag-stalking amongst the distant northern hills. Even so it was that he ever made good excuse for his absence, and Isalt thought no evil things, for she was trustful. Aye, though he went many times away and was long gone, Isalt suspected no wrong. So none beheld Harold when the curse was upon him in its violence. Alfred alone bethought himself of evil things. "'Tis passing strange," quoth he, "'that ever and anon this gallant lover should quit our company, and betake himself whither none knoweth. In sooth, twill be well to have an eye on old Siegfried's grandson." Harold knew that Alfred watched him zealously, and he was tormented by a constant fear that Alfred would discover the curse that was on him. But what gave him greater anguish was the fear that may hap at some moment, when he was in Yisalt's presence, the curse would seize upon him and cause him to do great evil unto her, whereby she would be destroyed, or her love for him would be undone for ever. So Harold lived in terror feeling that his love was hopeless, yet knowing not how to combat it. Now it befell in those times that the country round about was ravaged of a werewolf, a creature that was feared by all men, however so valorous. The werewolf was by day a man, but by night a wolf, given to ravage and to slaughter, and having a charmed life against which no human agency availed aught. Wheresoever he went, he attacked and devoured mankind, spreading terror and desolation round about, 
and the dream readers said that the earth would not be freed from the werewolf until some man offered himself a voluntary sacrifice to the monster's rage. Now, although Harold was known far and wide as a mighty huntsman, he had never set forth to hunt the werewolf, and, strange and how, the werewolf never ravaged the domain while Harold was therein. Whereat Alfred marveled much, and oftentimes he said, Our Harold, who is a wondrous huntsman, who is like unto him in stalking the timid doe and in crippling the fleeing boar? But how passing well doth he time his absence from the haunts of the werewolf? Such valour beseemeth our young Siegfried. Which being brought to Harold, his heart flamed with anger, but he made no answer, lest he should betray the truth he feared. It happened so about that time that Isolt said to Harold, Wilt thou go with me tomorrow, even to the feast in the sacred grove? That I cannot do, answered Harold. I am privily summoned hence to Normandy upon a mission of which I shall some time tell thee. I pray thee, on thy love for me, go not to the feast in the sacred grove without me. What sayest thou? cried Isolt. Shall I not go to the feast of St. Alfreda? My father would be sore displeased were I not there with the other maidens. T'were greatest pity that I should despise his love thus. But do not, I beseech thee, Harold implored. Go not to the feast of St. Alfreda in the sacred grove, and thou wouldst thus love me, go not. See, thou my life, on my two knees I ask it. How pale thou art! said Isolt, and trembling. Go not to the sacred grove upon the morrow night, he begged. Isolt marveled at his acts and at his speech. Then, for the first time, she thought him to be jealous, whereat she secretly rejoiced, being a woman. Ah, quoth she, thou dost doubt my love. But when she saw a look of pain come on his face, she added, as if she repented the word she had spoken. Or dost thou fear the werewolf? Then Harold answered, fixing his eyes on hers. Thou hast said it. It is the werewolf that I fear. Why dost thou look at me so strangely, Harold? cried Isolt. By the cruel light in thine eyes, one might almost take thee to be the werewolf. Come hither. Sit beside me, said Harold, tremblingly, and I will tell thee why I fear to have thee go to the feast of St. Alfreda tomorrow evening. Hear what I dreamed last night. I dreamed I was the werewolf. Do not shudder, dear love, for t'was only a dream. A grizzled old man stood at my bedside and strove to pluck my soul from my bosom. What wouldst thou? I cried. Thou soul is mine, he said. Thou shalt live out my curse. Give me thy soul, hold back thy hands, give me thy soul, I say. Thy curse shall not be upon me, I cried. What have I done that thy curse should rest upon me? Thou shalt not have my soul. For my offense shalt thou suffer, and in my curse thou shalt endure hell. It is so decreed. So spake the old man. And he strove with me, and he prevailed against me, and he plucked my soul from my bosom, and he said, Go, search, and kill. And, and lo, I was a wolf upon the moor. The dry grass cracked beneath my tread, the darkness of the night was heavy, and it oppressed me. Strange horrors tortured my soul, and it groaned and groaned, galled in that wolfish body. The wind whispered to me, 
With its myriad of voices, it spake to me and said, Go, search, and kill. And above these voices sounded the hideous laughter of an old man. <laughs> I fled the moor, whither I knew not, nor knew what motive lashed me on. I came to a river, and I plunged in. A burning thirst consumed me, and I lapped the waters of the river. They were waves of flame, as they flashed round me and hissed, and what they said was, Go, search, and kill! And I heard the old man's laughter again. <laughs> <laughs> A forest lay before me with its gloomy thickets and its somber shadows, with ravens, its vampires, its serpents, its reptiles, and all its hideous brood of night. I darted among its thorns and crouched amid the leaves, the nettles, and the brambles. The owls hooted at me, and the thorns pierced my flesh. Go, search, and kill, said everything. The hares sprang from my pathway. The other beasts ran bellowing away. Every form of life shrieked in my ears. The curse was on me. I was the werewolf. On, on I went with the fleetness of the wind, and my soul groaned in its wolfish prison, and the winds and the waters and the trees bade me, Go, search and kill, thou accursed brute. Go, search and kill. Nowhere was there pity for the wolf. What mercy thus should I, the werewolf, show? The curse was on me, and it filled me with a hunger and a thirst for blood. Skulking on my way within myself, I cried, Let me have blood, or oh, let me have human blood, that this wrath may be appeased, that this curse may be removed. At last, I came to the sacred grove. Somber loomed the poplars, the oaks frowned upon me. Before me stood an old man, Twas he, <laughs> grizzled and taunting, whose curse I bore. He feared me not. All other living things fled before me, but the old man feared me not. A maiden stood beside him. She did not see me, for she was blind. Kill, kill, cried the old man, and he pointed at the girl beside him. Hell raged within me. The curse impelled me. I sprang for her throat. I heard the old man's laughter once again, and then... <laughs> then I awoke, trembling, cold, horrified. <laughs> Scarce was this dream told when Alfred strode that way. Now, by our lady, quoth he, I bethink me never to have seen a sorrier twain. Then Isolt told him of Harold's going away, and how Harold had besought her not to venture to the feast of St. Alfreda in the sacred grove. Well, these fears are childish, cried Alfred boastfully. And thou sufferest me, sweet lady. I will bear thee company to the feast, and a score of my lusty omen with their good yew bows and honest spears shall attend me. There be no werewolf I trow will chance about with us. Whereat Isolt laughed merrily, and Harold said, "'Tis well. Thou shalt go to the sacred grove, and may my love and heaven's grace forfend all evil." Then Harold went to his abode, and he fetched old Siegfried's spear back unto Isolt, and he gave it into her two hands, saying, 
Take this spear with thee to the feast tomorrow night. It is old Siegfried's spear, possessing mighty virtue and marvelous. And Harold took Isolt to his heart and blessed her, and kissed her upon her brow and upon her lips, saying, Farewell, O my beloved. How wilt thou love me when thou knowest my sacrifice? Farewell, farewell forever, O elder lifest mine. So Harold went his way, and Isolt was lost in wonderment. On the morrow night came Isolt to the sacred grove, wherein the feast was spread, and she bore old Siegfried's spear with her in her girdle. Alfred attended her, and a score of lusty yeomen were with him. In the grove there was great merriment, and with singing and dancing and games withal, did the honest folk celebrate the feast of the fair Saint Alfreda. Suddenly, a mighty tumult arose, and there were cries of, The werewolf! The werewolf! <coughs> Terror seized upon all. Stout hearts were frozen with fear. Out from the further forest rushed the werewolf. Wood wrath bellowing hoarsely, gnashing his fangs, and tossing hither and thither the yellow foam from his snapping jaws. He sought Ysalt straight, as if an evil power drew him to the spot where she stood. But Ysalt was not afeard. Like a marble statue she stood and saw the werewolves coming. The yeomen, dropping their torches and casting aside their bows, had fled. Alfred alone abided there to do the monster battle. At the approaching wolf, he hurled his heavy lance, but as it struck the werewolf's bristling back, the weapon was all to shivered. Then the werewolf, fixing his eyes upon Isolt, skulked for a moment in the shadow of the yews, and thinking then of Harold's words, Isolt plucked old Siegfried's spear from her girdle, raised it on high, and with the strength of despair sent it hurtling through the air. The werewolf saw the shining weapon, and a cry burst from his gaping throat, a cry of human agony. And Isolt saw in the werewolf's eyes, the eyes of someone she had seen and known, but was for an instant only. And then the eyes were no longer human, but wolfish in their ferocity. A supernatural force seemed to speed the spear in its flight. With fearful precision, the weapon smote home and buried itself by half its length in the werewolf's shaggy breast just above the heart. And then, with a monstrous sigh, as if he yielded up his life without regret, the werewolf fell dead in the shadow of the youths. Then, ah then, in very truth there was great joy, and loud were the acclaims, while, beautiful in her trembling pallor, Isolt was led unto her home, where the people set about to give great feast to do her homage, for the werewolf was dead, and she it was that had slain him. But Isol cried out, Go, search for Harold, go, bring him to me, nor eat nor sleep till he be found. Good, my lady, quoth Alfred, how can that be, since he hath taken himself to Normandy? I care not where he be, she cried, my heart stands still until I look into his eyes again. Surely he hath not gone to Normandy, outspake Hubert. For this very eventide I saw him enter his abode. They hastened thither, a vast company. His chamber door was barred. 
Harold, Harold, come forth, they cried as they beat upon the door, but no answer came to their calls and knockings. Afeared, they battered down the door, and when it fell they saw that Harold lay upon his bed. He sleeps, said one. See, he holds a portrait in his hand, and it is her portrait. How fair he is, and how tranquilly he sleeps. But no, Harold was not asleep. His face was calm and beautiful, as if he dreamed of his beloved. But his raiment was red with the blood that streamed from a wound in his breast, a gaping, ghastly spear wound just above his heart.